Welcome everyone to another episode of the Mind Sculptors podcast. I am your host Callahan and on today's episode, I am joined by one of my favorite people in the CEDH community and host of the Past Priority podcast, Greg. Today we get into how to build control decks for CEDH, something that Greg and I talk about a lot just between the two of us, so we decided, hey, let's make this a podcast episode. But before we get into all that, I do want to take a moment to talk about today's sponsor, Dragon Shield. Dragon Shield sleeves are the only sleeves that I trust on my cards, and I have been using them for nearly seven years. I recently started using their dual mat sleeves, uh, which have an opaque background, but I also regularly use their just regular mat sleeves. Uh, the my preference for dual mats is I tend to prefer the race sleeves. They are a really pretty magenta color. And then the petrol sleeves, if you're unfamiliar with them, are like a dark bluish teal color. I really I have been using those for ever. Uh, so if you've ever seen me on a stream or something, chances are I've been using those sleeves for a very long time. Uh, but the, the great thing about these uh, dual mat sleeves is they're fully opaque, so you don't have to worry about seeing through uh, the back of your cards. So when you're going out to tournaments, you don't have to worry about getting any uh, penalties issued, any warnings, any DQs, potentially anything like that. It's really wonderful. Uh, so go ahead, go into the description of this episode, click on the Dragon Shield affiliate link to get your sleeves today while also supporting the Mind Sculptors. Thank you to Dragon Shield for supporting the Mind Sculptors. With all that said, let's get into this episode with my good friend, Greg. All right, we're talking about control today? Talking about control. Uh, all right. Before we get into that, though, uh, we right. do have an obligatory thing that you know, we do at the beginning of every episode, or at least I try to do it every episode. It's uh, Dear Sculpty Boy. And uh, you're on the show today, Greg. Uh, so mm -hmm. you are going to be an honorary Sculpty Boy for this. And uh, this question comes in from uh, our patron, Kyle Driver who asks, how do you fan out your mana base for five color decks? Uh, I They are trying to do a five color worm deck, and I'm not sure what I need to do for uh, the mana base. Um, and that is from hmm. Kyle Driver. So uh, from, from just like listening to it, sounds like that's a more casual deck. Yeah. Uh, but... Regardless, I think there are some heuristics that still kind of stand there. Um, how do you, because I know you, you know, Curious Control is four color deck, four and five color decks. You kind of start getting like it's very similar mana base, like mm -hmm. ideals. So like for you, what is it as far as mana bases that you usually do? Because I can tell you what I do. And what I do is. I, Probably not the best, but uh, what what does somebody who actually put some thought into it? Um. So it's always building the mana base as the final step. Um, like when you're constructing a deck on Moxfield or you're brewing something new, you can always put in like the safe lands if you want your command tower, your city of brass, your exotic orchard, um, your forbidden orchard, if you care to be on that effect. Um, mm -hmm. And then I wouldn't touch the mana base until you're done constructing the rest of your deck. Once you have every other card figured out, if you scroll to the bottom of Moxfield, it shows what percentage of mana pips are distributed across your spells. And then you can actually go up and look at it. And if you have a bunch of free cast effects, um, you can take that into consideration. And especially with higher colored decks, you don't have to be on all 10 dual lands, all 10 shock lands, right. all 10 whatever. You really just want to hit your core three colors um, because there are very few decks, even casual decks, that have a perfect. Perfectly even split across all colors. All the colors, yeah. Yeah. Usually even lean one way or another. And usually for like, I know for CEDH decks, they tend to be, especially once you get like any any of the like Soul Tie plus, uh, mm -hmm. once you get Soul Tie in, 
they, the, the mana bases tend to lean very heavily soul tie than, than the other two colors. Yeah. Um, and for, uh, for curious I don't control, know. It's, like, it's, sorry, go ahead. Um, oh no, you go ahead. What, what's it like yeah. with curious control? Uh, and for curious control with this issue of like looking at the mana base last, um, Shocklands. I don't run all of the Shocklands. I only run the good ones. So anything that has blue in it is mm-hmm. basically an auto include for a land because it's what the deck wants to produce most of the time. Right. And it's even getting to the point where I'm cutting Breeding Pool um, because Breeding Pool, yes, it does produce blue, but we only ever need one green pip for that deck, and it's for casting Thrasios. There's there's no need to have the ability to produce three green mana on turn two or whatever, turn three. We just mm-hmm. want yeah, single green pip, maybe another green pip down the line to cast a Seaborn Muse if we're on that effect. Um, and so I've just been cutting those in favor for some of the weirder five color lands. And so I'm on, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the artifact. The, the land that taps to create a man of any color if you control an artifact. Um, oh, um, Spire of Industry. Spire, yeah. yeah. Spire of Industry and Glimmer Void are cards that I've been testing out recently. Okay. And I think those do a pretty good job at rounding out uh mana bases but yeah the, the real key thing when you're building a, a mana base is you just want to look at what your deck actually needs and then make sure that your yeah. lands can, can make that. accommodate that mm-hmm. see see what i do especially for five color decks is i go to uh i pull up pongo's najila list <laughs> and i go to because on moxfield you can click the tab of what type it is i hit click that hit copy to clipboard go to my deck and hit paste and then i have my deck my mana base (laughs) i mean it works yeah you can't go wrong with the najila mana base i just i I, i'm like that's always where i at at minimum starts because i'm always just like "Eh, najila mana base is fine like it's a it's It's a a functional five color mana base um, I, I'd say it's fine, but actually, like Najila was going to be the one five color deck that like actually needs to make like green and white mana. Yeah. Other than just like the Grixis core, and so if you were looking at a five color Najila mana base compared to a five color like First Sliver or Kenrith mana base, I think those mana bases are actually very different. Oh, for sure. They're looking to do very different things. Yeah. So, I, I I always, I mean, and and this is something. Like, We'll we'll talk about when we talk about like the decks that we build and brewing control and how to brew control. Um, is uh, I I tend to play very blue white uh, centric decks even when I'm playing five color decks. Yeah, <laughs> a it lot just, of blue white in there. Listen, I like white and I like blue. It's like those are those those are the two colors that I tend to play a lot of. Uh, but uh, thank you, Kyle, for your question. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Reminder to you that if you are not a patron, you can join our $2 patron tier. That's the lowest tier we have. And you can ask us a question at minimum. Uh, and we'll answer your question here on Dear Sculpty Boys. Also, you get to watch episodes early and you get to see our beautiful faces during our episodes because we do video uh for the patrons only uh because it takes my computer like four hours to mix down uh video uh podcasts so and i can't i can't manipulate the audio the same way uh when it's video because when it's video i can't like cut out all the ums and I can't cut out all the like weird tangents we get on because I'm actually uh, terrified about that because I just committed to doing a video podcast for my own podcast, the past priority yeah. podcast, which we'll talk about later. But I'm I'm terrified about the workload from that since I've got a lot going on this week and I'm going to try to get it out uh, it's, on Friday. Oh, that's going to be fun. <laughs> it's not even so much the workload of editing video. It's yeah. the physical workload your computer has to go through to like it literally just comes down to like what is your computer's processing speed and ability to mix this down like granted 
my my computer now is much better than it was two years ago when I started doing the mm-hmm. show. But like when I start doing uh, spoilers, we are doing gameplay content. It is in the works. I am going to be bringing that back. But when we start doing that, half of why I stopped was because it just takes so much time to mix them down. And so no, it's just like, you know, and I, I tend to be, uh, I push things off to the very last minute. Um, like our, our last episode we did uh, with Surreal uh, that just came out. I was literally editing and doing the voiceovers and all of that stuff the night before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that is that that's that's uh the pace that I usually do things at granted uh that is self imposed but um mm-hmm. you know it is what it is but anyway uh you brought up a a great thing that i I do want to highlight a little bit here uh and as part of why I wanted to bring you on the show is you just started a podcast of your own this is the past pirate blah yeah. it's the past pri- <laughs> see this is where uh uh, audio is great because I can just cut this bullshit. You can just cut all this out. But what, what's fantastic about the the name about the past priority podcast is that um, originally, okay, we went through so many names, uh, and this project took a long time to get off the ground. Um, originally, we were going to call it. Oh uh, God, I it was just going to be like the CDH cast, and it was like, wait a minute, someone's already got that name. <laughs> Brain's and already done that. Shoot, I, I, I. I it was like last November, last October, I I settled on the past priority podcast and I was happy with it. And I made up a bunch of graphics and I wrote all this stuff up and I made the YouTube channel and I made all this stuff. And then I uh, hit like an emotional road bump and stopped working on it for a bit. And then I posted a bunch in January and I went on YouTube and I like started to set up stuff again. And I realized that someone else already set up something called the past priority podcast in that lull moment. And then... <laughs> They were <laughs> posting stuff like every other day for like a month. And I was like, oh, shoot, I can't do this now. I got to scrap all this. Yeah. And I waited a couple of months and they haven't posted anything since. So I was like, yeah, it's mine. I had the files before you guys showed up on YouTube. <laughs> I had this idea <laughs> first, so I'm taking this over. But it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's the past priority podcast. It's great. You can call it the PP cast. <laughs> the PP cast. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I am. I was one of your very first subscribers on there. Uh, because it's yeah. good it's good time um but uh one of the big things that uh we really wanted to discuss surrounding that is i mean you and i became friends a few months ago mm-hmm. I, and it, it's shocking to me that we actually haven't been friends longer <laughs> because we run in the same circles uh yeah. so it's like it was shocking to me that it took us forever to actually interact and talk um but you and i i i think it was a josh's server is where we met on uh, uh, mind muscle magic i believe yeah so. or was it on twitter that we we met i i definitely tweeted at you a lot um back in the early days when i was on twitter um, okay it might have been that i don't know okay. it just kind of grew I, I, slowly i mean there's the, it's so weird in this community because there's like a half half the people i've met on twitter Half the people I've met on Discord, and it's like I, I which ones which it's hard to like remember, uh, mm-hmm. especially when you're on both platforms. But uh, we we started working on like really talking about and theorizing about how to play control good, um, <laughs> and so we've talked about that a lot. But you actually talked about that on the Playing With Power podcast with Drake and Ashani. Al? Ashani. Was okay. Ashani, yeah. Um, and so we don't really need to retread all that. Go listen to that episode. Instead, what I want to talk about is how do you br- how to brew for control? Because you and I brew a lot of control decks. And um one of mine thank god is no longer on the database it's off the database the, <laughs> it is it, it was it was so funny there there were when when they released that update uh there were like a bunch of people who were really upset and then there was me just like i've been set free <laughs> <laughs> the curse is lifted um oh my god it was okay it was such an emotional roller coaster getting my deck on the database yeah because 
I, I, I love Curious Control well before my list was on there. And I saw it, or I heard from word of mouth that uh, Sick Robot or Reed was going to take his list off the database um, or, or was going to stop maintaining his list because he just wanted someone else to take over. And I searched around a lot of the, the CDH Discord servers and I was like, I can't find anyone else working on Curious Control. I, I love yeah. this deck. I've been playing it for so long now. And why isn't anyone else hype about this? Because I just I had all this new tech that I wanted to bring to light. And so I actually submitted Curious Control. Uh, it was like the three cycles before it got on. And I kept on getting feedback where it was like, list is like not good enough or blah, blah, blah. And so I was editing that. And I don't know. It, it felt like such a challenge to get the list onto the database. And then it got on and I had like a mini voice chat party with all my friends. It was like, hey, it finally got on after a year of work. Um, and then like two months passed and it's like, oh, my list is just on the database. Like, I feel like I've I've hit that cap and there's nothing to really work to anymore. Yeah. So now instead of working to to build the perfect database list, I'm just grinding and making. Oh, I was on Curious Control version uh, 6.5, which yeah. is a build with six creatures in it uh, and cuts a lot of the weird fluff and takes some weird routes. Um, not ready to share any of these builds yet, but I have so much going on in my private mox field that basically every day I'm waking up and making a new list. Oh, like yeah. two or three cards off, but it, it it's <sighs> one of those things that it, not to go too far into this, but the, the oh, whole yeah. like database thing, because I've also gone through that roller coaster and had those conversations with like one-on-one -on -one conversations with Reed where, uh, you know, sometimes something will happen and you're like, what the fuck? And it just, it, it there was so much community discourse, discourse about it. And my whole take on that, and this might just be for our patrons, is that the database, number one, they all do that for free. Um, nobody makes any money off of that thing, and nobody's paid to do that job. Uh, so the fact that it exists should tell you, should give you all the context you need for the intentions behind it. Nobody's there's nothing nefarious there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, it, it's just, it's like, it's so weird because there is this like perception that the database is more influential or is like, because there is some like clout associated with having a deck on the database, right? Like, People There's a are, little bit like, of cloud, <laughs> like a little bit, but like it also just doesn't matter because like, I mean, let's be honest here. Like, so let's look at AO or Ow, mm -hmm. or I think it's AO. That's what they were saying on at Worlds over I, the weekend. So that's I what I'm no going to call it. They were saying AO at the uh, on Worlds broadcast stream. So AO it is. Um but they, the like, Charles took that really far at Punt City, right? Mm -hmm. He took Heliod, like the OG Heliod, really far. That's on the database. Uh, the Koi Beto's build of Magda, nothing, like anything mm -hmm. that's on the database, right? So it's like, the database is there to be a tool to give you an idea of stuff that exists. And just because it's not on there doesn't mean it doesn't exist, I guess, is what I'm saying. I don't know. It's like it, it like Arden Crom's not on there, but I get like 20 messages a day. Eh, that's a bit of an over exaggeration, but I get messages every day from different people who are playing the list. and are asking questions about it and are like, well, why do you do this? Or what do you think about doing this? And like, I submitted it, but if it doesn't get on there, it, it's fine. Like my life is going to continue. And you know, like it, it has nothing to do with my value or my deck's value or any of that. Like, it's just like, and on a, on the topic of like farming clout from the, the database, um, I think it's, kind of a weird accusation to say that everyone who's anyone who's got decks on the database is just doing it for the clout. Um, yeah, I 
really only got or attempted to get my list on the database because I was going to be really sad if there wasn't a Thrasios File Smasher control represented on there. Yeah. I don't care if it has my name on it. I don't care if it has someone else's name on it. Like, I just want that to be represented in that space because right. it's the it's the resource for new players, too. Right. Right. And so if a new player comes in and they look at Thrasios File Smasher and the only options they see are like, you know, it's like Turbo Naws or there's a mid range, but the other mid range lists are just Turbo Naws. They're not actually. They're Turbo Naws with Assassin's Trophy. Um. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's the best way to describe those lists, actually. Um, <laughs> but it, it's not an accurate representation of what Curious Control is. And I just wanted to make sure there was a. A control list on the database yeah um, but it's interesting because when we literally brew specifically controlled decks decks that are caffeine uh or excuse me the soda the came out um but like one of the things we talk about a lot so like i i, I forget exactly how many counter spells your deck is running but one of the things that i've tried very diligently with Jeskai uh, Stoneblade is to make it as interactive and as capable of dealing with multiple threats while being as efficient at doing that as possible. And there's, mm -hmm. there, there, there's one of the things that you get where... So playing control in 1v1, you don't run into this issue of your counter spell is a one for one, right? The problem is, is you can do that all day in a one V one matchup because you've got, you're only going up against another person. Mm -hmm. If you brick out on resources, you still have pushed yourself farther ahead because you're able to develop other things at the same time. The difference is, is in CEDH, really just EDH. You're also playing against two other players who mm -hmm. are also doing that and you stopping this person also allowed this person to do this and this person to do this. And so there's a lot more dynamic pieces to interaction and to playing control in EDH just in general. So when we're building decks, what are the things that we are looking for as like, are the the like the interaction suite just looks different, right? Like it looks completely different than it does in modern, than it does in legacy, anywhere else. So explain some of the decision making and like why what type of effects we are looking for in EDH when it comes to building these types of control lists. So you really want um a few main things that you look at for interaction. You want to be efficient, of course, mm -hmm. right? We're not playing any cancels in this format. Um, but you also want your interaction to be flexible and you want to minimize the the one for one aspect of playing mm -hmm. control in CDH. So stuff like Delayed Blast Fireball and Flame Sweep, these are perfect examples of cards that um they're flexible and they they break that one for one mindset when right. trading. Right. If I cast a delayed blast fireball, it is dealing with like there could be a Malcolm with Glinthorn attempting to move to combat. And that delayed blast fireball stops that in its tracks while also interacting with the Timna players board while also clearing like a Magda and maybe like right. one of Magda's dwarves. That fireball is just it's one card that I cast that just dealt with everyone right there on the stack. And then you put the other two players, that Timna and that Magda player, in a really weird spot because they can't counter or interact with that spell without throwing the game. And there's a little bit of a political advantage you have with these wipe or three for one trading effects where it's like you can't deal with this now because if you counterspell this to save your Timna, you're letting the Magda or you're letting the um, the Malcolm player just win. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you really get to hit everyone at once. And then the other thing is you want cards to be flexible. So the card that I've been trying to force, but it really isn't the best, is uh, Drown in the Lock. So slightly easier to cast than a counterspell. Um, and it's flexible in the sense that it's both creature removal and just a hard counter based on how many cards are in the opposing graveyard. And, you know, the longer the game mm -hmm. goes, the 
the more efficient drown the lock is going to be. Um, and most of the time, because it is a blue and a black, you're not casting it on turn one or turn two. Um, but it's a really adaptive piece of interaction for later on in the game. And we really want spells like that, where the blasts are also great examples. Stuff that can be used to remove right. permanents on board and remove permanents or remove spells off the stack. Um, and then how I do think, we keep up with yeah, burning those? That's a totally different discussion. <laughs> it, it's it's one of those things where uh, one of the reasons why I like Arden Krom so much as a control deck is it answers some of those problems with the interaction of Arden and uh, Skull Clam because mm -hmm. you have because one of the big issues is when you're doing the like spend a card to deal with X, right? Is that you're now down a card uh, and your opponents are not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the advantage of having, you know, Skull Clamp and Arden and being able to do those things is that you now have situations where your removal is also card advantage. Mm -hmm. So it kind of fixes that issue in some some form because you know it's like you know there's a ragavan or there's a magda okay i'm gonna equip it to the magda magda's gone oh i draw two cards hey i have an answer for this thing and it kind of snowballs really quickly actually i mean you've played against the the arden crom deck the just the arden and the skull clamp on its own will draw you so many freaking cards it's gross <laughs> and no one's gonna burn a piece of interaction on the Arden. No one's gonna kill the Arden. It just, yeah, <laughs> nobody it wants happen. to deal with the Arden because it feels like a waste of removal. But also, yeah. it's going to draw me a zillion cards. Uh, but I also That's think. I... Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. What are you gonna say? Um, on on the <laughs> quick story on like really weird cards that shouldn't get interacted with. Um, the only reason I was on Wave Break Hippocamp for the longest time was because I kept on getting targeted when I tried to run, like, better pieces of card advantage, right? Mm -hmm. But Wave Break Hippocamp is, like, the worst of these effects. It dies to my Flame Sweep, it only draws cards when I cast spells on opponent's turn, so I can't, like, cantrip with it on my own turn. Um, it doesn't do any, like, weird combat things unless you put a Curiosity on it, which is just bad. Um, but it got to the point where I would just jam so many of these really crappy card draw effects. And then when you have three or four different ones in play at the same time, people just can't interact with all of that at once. Yeah. Um, I ended up having a game where I went land, crypt, wave break, hippo camp, and someone force of willed it um, <laughs> because they were so sick of me having guard advantages. <laughs> they were just like, I had to get rid of it. Um, I, I've I've had people I, I cut it from the deck immediately after that. I was like, "Fuck this!" <laughs> I, I, I've had a couple people interact with uh, Arden before, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, that's that. That is the correct thing to do. You're 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 right. You're not wrong." Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I can't argue with that. Uh, but it's interesting. So one of the things that I think is kind of always an interesting topic. When you're talking about you're the only control deck at a table is the concept of counter magic. Mm -hmm. Now, my deck, my my version of control is is very interesting because mid range and control play in very similar places, and they do very similar things, but like they blur together and I feel like the way people identify them is based solely on the density of counter spells, which I think is just incorrect. That's but, just wrong. But like my, my way of playing control is to sit back very, you know, just sit back with my grip of cards, use on the board abilities to draw cards keep things off the board and, you know, pressure life totals and then use my in-hand cards as sparingly as possible uh, to only deal the most imminent issue. Um, your deck, on the other hand, is 
like the way you build it is very different in that you've got, you know, fire covenant, you're playing flame sweeps, you're playing, you know, you're playing mana leak, which I love, although we'll argue that uh, (laughs) I'm going to argue that people should be later on in the show. I'm going to argue for a card. We'll we'll have a debate on a particular card, but we're not going to debate it right now. Okay. We're going to talk about uh, specifically counterbalance when you're brewing these decks. I I I get takes from all over the spectrum on whether counterbalance is good or not, and it like it fits my play style. It fits the way that I approach the game. But I'm 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 interested in your opinion on this and your your look at this because when you're brewing a deck and because I think this this is really important because control needs to be very I, I think I say this in my primer and I think I've said this before but control needs to be tailored to what you expect to be seeing in a particular meta. That's what yeah. control does really well. And so if you're building control and you're not building it with a particular thing in mind, you're brewing it incorrectly. And so that's why I think just some context on all of that. But so for you, when you look at counterbalance and the metas that you tend to play in, where what is the value of counterbalance do you like it what's your kind of whole take on so i've been playing control for a long time now Mm -hmm. um and as i when i started playing control because my life total kept on getting bullied back when i was playing ad Mm -hmm. and more proactive strategies and i just wanted to take that pressure off and so over time i took out a lot of the rituals and I took out a lot of the attention drawing spells like ad nauseum or Sylvan library and necropotence. And I just started running um, other forms of advantage. And that all boils down to, it all boils down to like, as a player, I've always been pressured by um, whatever creature um, because the games that I lose are mostly lost due to combat damage from crumbs. Um, (laughs) or someone just beating my face in with a dargo but like it the my my play group tends to answer my my play style by just killing me with combat damage yeah um and counterbalance is one of those cards that it's really good at interacting on the stack it's incredibly powerful with sensei's dividing top to the point where i think that interaction is like, I, I wish they couldn't be played in the same deck together because it <laughs> basically feels like cheating when it's like, oh, every time a spell goes on the stack, I pay one CMC and counter it. Like it's it's so incredibly powerful, but it doesn't interact with a lot of stuff on board. And right. it's very limited on its own. And so if you just have the counterbalance and you don't have any way to change the top card, you have no cantrip in hand, you have no crom in play, you have no um, like fetch land, you have no sensei's top counterbalance is like it's threatening the counter spell. Right. And then someone casts the the dark ritual. Right. To attempt to ramp up to a Nas. And if you can't show a one off the top of your deck right there, like you, you flip a three or you flip a two, um, they're just going to go off anyways. Right. And then it it just makes the whole like controlling situation very awkward to run counterbalance. I love the card. I mm-hmm. wish I played it more, but I'd rather just run a counter spell for the Adnaz. Um because interacting on the stack and nabbing their one payoff spell in in my mind is better than just threatening um a constant onboard effect if that makes sense at all i Um, i I definitely get that perspective and i think that's very fair i think uh sorry can we pause for just one second um yeah uh i have to get something set up really quick yeah Um, i'm sorry Uh, and cut and cut yep uh i have a lot of shit going on this week and um 
the the podcast is actually the past party podcast uh zach and um evan are going to be recording uh, an animar deck tech tonight Ooh. and i was really stupid when i made my riverside account and i've linked it to my personal email and so i have to <laughs> uh send them the login <laughs> to my personal email account <laughs> Uh, which I will not be saying. Nice. Uh, uh, I understand. Uh, Riverside is great, though. They don't sponsor us, but uh, Riverside is fantastic. I love the service. Um, I have been very much not regretting that subscription at all. Uh, oh, yeah, it's a great subscription. Um, I think I'm paying for the one that does 15 hours uh, of recording. Yeah. Um, which I is... I don't know what I mine is. I think I just paid for, like, the max because it's just... Our episodes yeah. are just so fucking, like... I mean, our episodes for a long time were very long, and, like, even now, like, our recording sessions, like, the episode we did that just came out on Monday, yesterday, I mean, I took this that... It was, like, two hours and 45 minutes the re entire recording session and i oh like God. crushed it down into an hour um it it, it was it's just just tangents man uh tangents are fun though <laughs> but it's not even uh, just tangents it's that like like surreal can talk a lot ian can talk a lot i can talk a lot cobblepot can talk talk a lot and so it's like when you get enough people on the thing, it's it just gets so long. And yeah, it's like we're we're doing our uh tier list video tomorrow. We're recording that with oh, Brian. Nice. And uh that sounds fun. Oh yeah. We're doing it a little bit differently this time, but I'm I'm excited. Uh, instead of like S through F tier, we're doing like S A B in C and S is like optimal A is good or great B is good and then C is fringe mm -hmm. and basically we're not going to talk about anything that's fringe like if we we all unanimously decided that a card is A tier we're not going to talk about that or we're not going to talk about the stuff that we all think is unanimously S tier or whatever because it's just like takes time to record all of that stuff. Oh, um, it really does. But it also was one of the things where I was like, I don't want to like rank commanders and like I, I'm trying to be very conscious of like where the community is at right now and trying to give even like our bad takes on things in like spin them even in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Um, because of the fact that like the community's just been fucking negative recently. Uh oh so god, yeah. I, I'm trying to give it more of a just like here are the things that are that are like the best or what what we think are like really good and good and I'm, like, I'm good with my recording stuff. I made sure that was all set up. So um we can go back to good deal. Um Anyhow, um, and uh, action. Uh, <laughs> so I know for me with counterbalance, it's always a it, it, uh, yes, it's, issue with counterbalance. Yeah. Uh, counterbalance is one of those things where I'm always kind of like on the fence about it. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of similarly to what you were saying, because. It, it, there, there's some decks where I've been like, man, this just feels so good. I love it. Um, and then there's decks where I'm just like, man, I wish this was just literally anything else. Um, I know in when I play Thrasios Tumna, I tend to cut it um, just because of the fact that I'm like, I feel like I have better advantage engines and better ways of interacting in those colors. But like in Art and Crom, I'm playing it, and part of that is I have enough top deck manipulation, or at least top deck information, that uh, I can 
comfortably know whether or not I want to let something go through. Like the reality mm-hmm. chip, for instance, like just on its own, just it, sitting there, I can look at it before the trigger and just be like, eh, I don't know. And you just having that information, I think, is very helpful in making that card better. Um, mm-hmm. I think my take on it is if I were not playing cards that just play well with my deck anyway, that also synergize with it, I wouldn't play it. Yeah, I think no, is, that makes a lot of sense. Kind of my, I, I um, think if you're playing stuff that just like like Elsha, I think is a great place to play that. Uh, places where you have that top deck information already, I just think is wild. Like the the Falco top. Falco Top can definitely play Counterbalance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, Falco yeah. Top is a cool-ass deck. I think that's a really neat deck. It is so cool. Um, I, I thought about building it, but I just... Building decks is a thing. But So the next thing that I, I want to talk about... So here's here's when we're, we're, we're looking at our interaction suite. We talked about the sweepers... I, I want to. I think targeted removal. I think is probably fairly straightforward. Run swords if you can. Mm-hmm. Run path. Uh, people have finally fucking listened to me and started playing Winds of Abandon. Cards good. It's, it's like so good. I I have heard multiple people and seen multiple people tell me that Winds of Abandon is floating around now, and now you have to worry about it. So we're running this card so that we don't have. We're running. Chain or uh, what is it? Uh, chain. Uh, what's the the XX card? Um, um, ch- uh, Chalice of the Void. Yeah, we're running like Chalice of the Void, so we don't have to worry about this. Or we're ru- we're running this card, and it stops this. And or we're running like an extra mountain or something, so we don't like completely get fooled over by this card. Mm-hmm. Um. I, I think there are some things I like to be on more just one sided. Uh, we, we've talked about this before, but I actually think this is interesting to kind of dive into a little bit is you play in curio control. And part of this is because of the fact that your commanders can support this, but you tend to play a lot of not one-sided board wipes um Mm -hmm. stuff that kind of hits everything whereas i tend to play winds of abandon and dbf and uh obviously cyclonic rift i think the only hits everything on the board wipe that i play is supreme verdict and i think that again just comes down to Hi, I'm a blue white player. This can't be countered. Get wrecked. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's too much on the board. You can't counter this. It's all going away. <laughs> so, um, but but fun. but explain where you're at with like board wipes. So funny enough that we're actually talking about board wipes right now because I am working on a complete deck overhaul. Okay. Um, and I'm cutting it into two different versions because from all of the the podcasts that I've guested on recently or um, conversations I've had with other players in the community, it comes down to uh, control isn't good into a tournament Mm -hmm. because you you don't have a predictable metagame. And so I'm working on two versions of this list. One that is going to be really good into a NAS metagame and one that is going to be really good into your Brassios X cluster game um, where you just have a bunch of mid-range nonsense going on for four hours and board wipes are really good in that mid-range nonsense yeah when I when I'm playing against a bunch of other Thrasios Tim the Dork decks or Thrasios Bruce or Thrasios Vile it doesn't really matter what the combination is if I'm playing against a bunch of decks that want to just sit there and do the mid-range thing Board wipes are really good against that. Yeah. And it's it's if I have one creature in play and I'm casting a toxic deluge and I'm able to get four or five creatures off of it just from everyone else's board, that's so worth it for me. Yeah. I don't I don't care if I'm losing like if I develop a mayhem devil, which is like I don't know, a cute creature, I develop like a seedborn muse, and then all of a sudden 
there's like a massive board coming away from Winota, and I just have to do like a deluge for six. Like I'm 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 gonna bite that. I'll lose my Seaborn Muse, but it's better to lose one thing or two things and take everyone else off their entire game plan. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to agree with that. I, I just yeah. I don't know. For me, like I, I think if you're in white, I think Winds of Abandon is just so free to play. Oh. Like yeah, to have 100%. a one sided board wipe like that, like it, it it's it it not it, I keep stuttering and it's driving me insane. To have a spell that is an overloaded spell that checks all the boxes for you is just exactly what you're looking for. And the pushback I got originally when I was playing that card, like remember when I put it in Lavinia and people were like, doesn't that go like, doesn't that kind of screw over Lavinia? And I remember dead face looking at somebody and being like, hey, how many basics do you run in your deck? Yeah. (laughs) Like that's a it's a bullshit defense <laughs> or a bullshit argument against the card. It's like, oh, but like let's just get all of their basics out. And it was like, bro, every deck is on tainted pact. You're like you're yeah. lucky to see a single island in lists nowadays. <laughs> but- I I am considering uh playing Settle the Wreckage. Like I, I if you could target it into a Winota, yeah, like yeah, it's really like, solid. I, 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 I am Looking at that as a maybe board card to be like, if I expect to see this it, or at my local meta, if this is really prominent, I'm going to play Settle the Wreckage because this card is going Fantastic. to <laughs> completely ruin their day. Um, and here's the other thing that I also want to say as another defensive wins of Abandon, even if they do, like, get a few lands off of it, it's still worth it. Like, it's still <laughs> worth it. If you can get... You, they lose those cards permanently. They're exiled. Right? They're gone. <laughs> They're gone. You don't They're have gone. to it's worry about back. them. Them getting basics is, like, completely fine. <laughs> Who cares? Uh, if if they're going to dump four creatures from their hand, right, and then you're just like, whoop, it's all gone. They don't get four cards back in their hand. They don't have that resource. They just get more mana. And if you have a ton of mana it doesn't matter if you can't put it into anything if you can't dump it into a thrasios mm-hmm. like excess mana it really it's useless um there's this legacy v- gameplay video that i watched a long time ago i don't remember who said this but there was a comparison made between two decks and one that was mana starved and one that was mana flooded mm-hmm. right so it was like an opening hand of no lands compared to seven lands and one player ke- keeps on drawing lands and the other player just keeps on drawing spells and eventually you know they start to get lucky and the person with all the land starts to get spells and vice versa uh the guy who is mana starved that entire time is more likely to win those games Mm -hmm. um because you know one land one turn a second land the next turn and you can cast several cards from your hand right right but if you're stuck to getting one card per turn but you can make your land drops for days. It doesn't matter if you can make your land drops for days. You're just at a disadvantage because you can't cast things. Yeah. Um, like I'd always rather be mana starved and just like sitting with a ton of cards in my hand than yeah. like, Oh, there's six lands here. Like this is useless. <laughs> this, so. this is also where when, uh, when I look at targeted removal and I, I look at like the, especially when you're playing white, Guys, mm-hmm. have to exile. Play it. It's, it's so good. good. It's, it's really good. <laughs> 90% of the time, it's better than swords. Uh, Assassin's Trophy literally just re- reads green, black, destroy target, non-land permanent. Yeah. It's, it's so good. It, it, it <laughs> I don't is think I've one ever of seen someone things. get a basic off it. <laughs> People tell me all the time, it's like, well, why would you play that when Besages exist? It's like, they can get any, any card with a basic land tight so they could still mm-hmm. go get a duel put it into play they could still get like that is a completely different discussion but mm-hmm. at the exile like ghost quarter stuff like that like i i honestly think it is worth considering playing like i i am genuinely i'm i'm toying around with playing like one of two different decks at punt city or not punt city at march not marchessa at Oktoberfest. 
Yeah. And I'm either going to play a wild version of Lavinia <laughs> or I'm going to play Arden Krom. And I haven't decided which one that I want to play. Um, and I think it all comes down to once I start getting closer to when the uh, event happens and I start feel, getting a more vibe of where people are like falling, I'm going to be like, OK, we're, we're going this way or not, because I'm going to play a version of Lavinia that plays literally every land destruction spell in the game. Uh <laughs> It is awesome. It is one of my favorite. Every time I've ever played the build of Lavinia, it's the build that was on the database played the lighter version of it. But the build that I played and I regularly played here in my local meta is a deck that plays Sunder. It plays Ravages. It plays Armageddon. It plays Fall of the Thran. Uh, There's another niche one that I don't remember the name of it. Uh, but it plays like the full suite of them and it just fun fact. Sunder is one of my favorite anti uh, ad nauseum cards in Lavinia. That's really good, especially if they've made their land drop for turn and then ad nauseum. And you're just like, OK, in response, Sunder. And they're just like, oh, I can't cast spells now. <laughs> so good it's it's it, it's delightful um so I, I i i i'm saying this partially because i know this episode isn't going to probably come out till at least around like that general time of uh, yeah around october Oktoberfest. fest um but i i'm i'm really excited for october fest because i i just i i have mm, I have. I hope you can hear my knuckles crack there because that was I, really loud. <laughs> I, I really. I have some. I'm ready to go in there, and I'll probably lose games, and that's fine. But like, I, I just, I love playing control, and I think it's really fun. Uh, so the the card that I wanted to talk to you about from your deck, and then I'm going to talk to you about a card from my deck, and the, the partially why I wanted to talk about these is these are brewing decisions for when we are making our decks, and you know going into certain metas, why we do X, Y, Z. So you are playing Mana Leak. <laughs> and yes, I don't think yes, that's a bad card for, for what it's worth. As somebody who played modern for a, way before the, the, the counter spells that exist now, I remember the days when Mana Leak was a mainstay. So like I... Yeah, I agree with you there. What is what is the thought on the card in in the rationale? So this was actually like a really hard decision for me, but I um I wanted more hard counters. And hard mm-hmm. counters in the sense of like I was sick and tired of losing to Malcolm on turn 1, Glinthorn on t- on turn 2. Mm-hmm. And I needed ways to deal with Glinthorn that weren't just creature removal because I wanted to be able to interact with other things mm-hmm. and mana leak just kind of works. Um, I mean, cause how many times do you see a game where someone's like, you know, ritual, ritual artifact ramp payoff spell, mm-hmm. right? Most of the time they're not going to have three additional mana to yeah. pay for the mana leak or the miscast or whatever I'm doing. And so it's not good at interacting post ad nauseum when they have all this mana and all this free interaction. But I have yet to have someone been able to pay for it when I'm trying to interact with them on their payoff spell. So right. someone, you know, they cast whatever their turn two win attempt or their turn one wheel. And it's like, mana leak. Or here's just a piece of interaction to, right. to mess you up. And even if they do have the mana to pay for it, you know, they're now Trinisphere effectively on whatever they just cast. Right. Mm-hmm. And that that really messes up the value of cards in your deck. Because if you yep. look at every single spell that you wanted to cast and you add three CMC to it, is that spell really worth it? Uh, one of the reason why CDH is so gosh darn efficient is because everything is just really cheap and really good at what it does. And right. if you start to mess with the mana cost of spells, or the, not the, the actual mana cost, but the effective mana cost of spells, it really changes how people evaluate those cards. And it's like, should I cast this if someone has this kind of effect up? Um, 
it it's better than counter spells that it just requires a blue and a colorless. And so it frees yeah. me up on pips as well, which is really great. That's a similar similar logic as to why I play memory lapse. Although I think memory lapse is even funnier because I, I've got to do this multiple times and it's my favorite thing in the world is for somebody to go ritual, ritual, payoff spell, add nons, right? They burned through all their stuff to get to the add nons to build up to this thing. And I just go memory lapse. And I had somebody look down at their cards, look at me, look down at their cards, and they're just like, so it goes on my deck. I go, yeah. I'm like, well, that's annoying. <laughs> the fact no, that it I... doesn't send it to the graveyard can be disruptive. Um, it, it It's also very interesting because what I've also seen with it is when you're in counter wars, uh, if you use a memory lapse to counter somebody's counter spell, you now know that you've put that on top of their deck. So later on, when the thing, when somebody else is trying to do something, you can effectively bully that player into using their interaction because the table knows that it's there. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it is one of my favorite things to do. Um, it's also just, like I said, it's a hard counter spell. And I think like, imagine, imagine because Goto is very popular into tournament metas, right? Yeah. Imagine somebody sits down, turn to treasonous odor, pays all this life <laughs> to go to Goto memory lapse. <laughs> <laughs> Even in that sense, think about a memory leak in that situation. You can pay another nine life for Goto. Yeah, exactly. It can like be really funny sometimes. <laughs> like those two spells. Like I, I, I really think people need to be playing more of these types of cards. Hell, counter spell even. Like just people need to. Like this is the thing when I'm talking about when if you're going to the next tournament that's going on, when you are brewing your deck or to take to that and then you're making decisions to go into that deck. I think that if you're just deciding to play control, you need to have counter spells that counter everything. You know what I mean? Like it, that, that's one mm -hmm. of the things that I think is very frustrating when I see like the control decks and they like only play like miscast and, you know, like I've had people ask me why I play spell pierce instead of uh, miscast. And I'm like, well, it just it hits way more things. Yeah. Like I it's I, really flexible. Also, yeah. there, there there's a reason I play stubborn denial. Like I play stubborn denial because stubborn denial is a hard counter spell that is one mana that well, not a hard counter spell, but it's much more flexible. And I mean, hell days. Right, like I was about to bring up days. <laughs> I, I, I love think that card. control decks should be on days. This has been like a hot topic in my uh, my regular play group because some of the Nas players they love days, mm -hmm. right? Because they love being able to ramp into their Adnas or their Remora on turn one and still be able to protect it. Yeah, um, because it costs you nothing. It just island on board. I have interaction. Right. It and is, it's also a good early tempo play. It's a great early tempo play. I mean, I don't care if I lose a land on turn one or turn two, if I can stop your Ristic study, right? You tap out right. for a Ristic study on turn two, where you're like, oh, I'd happily go down a land to stop that Ristic study from hitting play. And I just like replay that, it next turn, right? Like, it's fine. You're returning it's fine. it to your hand. Like, Especially I, if I, you already have fast mana, right? Like, if you can present like land chrome mox like thrasios on turn one right and then i have to bounce that land to stop your ristic study or remora from landing right i still have two mana on turn two yeah. and cdh is so powerful that you're still gonna like make mana properly as the game goes on yeah. uh, it's so good hey, days is amazing i i very very highly recommend days i also love Especially if you're playing Lavinia in your deck or as your commander, a card like Delay 
I mean, hell, even if Tyranneth Magistrate is in your deck, like delay is reads just basically just straight up counter target spell. If yeah. either of those cards are in your deck. Um same thing yeah, goes for Teferi, right? Like if you're playing Teferi, it ends up reading the same way. If suspend is the same way, the, the removal card suspend, uh, mm-hmm. which is I'm on the fence about when I play it. It sometimes is good. Sometimes it's not. Uh, but like it's it's hilarious because depending on what is in your deck and how you're playing or what your commander is, it can just read counter target spell remove target permanent or yeah. remove target creature it's hilarious it's it's really funny because a lot of those time based effect effects specifically um phasing delay and suspend most of the time you're not going to see that ever come off the delay unless you're like delaying turn one mm-hmm. right but if you delay someone's underworld breach or an ad nauseum on like turn three right it, it comes back on turn six. Everyone is either going to be like so like piled up with resources that that gnaws that we all see coming is just never going to resolve. Or somebody's already right. won. Or right? someone's already won. The game's already over. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's he- it's ridiculous to me that people don't play delay as a as a counter spell because it is just probably the best two mana counter spell out there yeah. over over mana drain. One hundred percent. I fully agree with you on that. I, 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 I just think these the like the three spells that we just talked about of delay, memory lapse, mana leak are underplayed, underconsidered. I, I get memory lapses a little bit more, a little bit more on the edge. Uh, but yeah. you know, I, 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 I think I don't think enough people realize how big tempo swings like that are. Uh, in CEDH and then how you can use that to your advantage in a very positive way just because of that. Is king. Yeah, like it, yeah. it is absolutely wild to me. Um, yeah. It just knowing a piece in someone's hand or the lack of knowledge of what's in your hand right. lets you get away with so much stuff. Um, I mean, okay. Uh, Gustav, if you're listening to this podcast, I don't play Ad Nauseam because it reveals the counter spells that go into my hand. And then when I cast Ad Nauseam and I reveal four counter spells and put them into my hand, how can you look at me with a straight face and say, like, that's good for me? Because I'm just going to get priority bullied for the next four spells. Right. Um, like, <laughs> information is super good because if I have a draw effect that draws five cards, right, and like three of them happen to be counter spells. Like, you don't know what those cards are. They're face down. It's face down information. There is no way for you to know unless you have a Gataxian probe. And that's what makes control really powerful is it's like I I can be really vague about the answers that I have in my hand. Like I have counter spells. Sure. But it's like a fluster storm and a mental misstep. Right. That doesn't stop the underworld breach. But if you have interact, you have mana, you've got cards in hand. If you can interact with this, I can make sure your interaction resolves. Mm-hmm. Um and so it, it really playing with hidden information really lets you get away with a lot of stuff. And it's scary, right? If you're sitting across the table and the person's like, I've got seven mana and a full grip, you're not just blind casting your gnaws into that. Right. There's no way you're winning that. And that person could be sitting there with seven mana and five lands in hand, right? And that that information is hidden. You have no idea what they've got. So, yeah, I don't that's, know. That's why I tell people all the time. It's like. Jeff Probst, if you're listening, I'm doing you proud. Uh, you know, magic is just a game of survivor, man. It's just yeah. magic the gathering survivor. That's all it is. It's, it's the best comparison is commander to survivor. Yeah, command it's just magic the gathering survivor. You're just, you know, sometimes you have to team up sometimes and then you'll eventually betray your team. And then, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's you know, sometimes you have to make the make it through the turn cycle. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's all that matters i'm looking forward to my untap steps so. i'm just just trying to make it to my untap step guys <laughs> oh my goodness so greg for people again we talked about this a little bit at the top of the show but just to you know recap uh if they want to find you if they want to check out your show if they want to follow you on twitter support you anyway uh 
how can people do that? All right. Um, so I just launched a podcast called the Past Priority Podcast. Uh, you can find that on Spotify. If you just search Past Priority Podcast, it, the logo is black on or white on black or black on white. I don't remember, um, but it's pretty easy to see. And then um, you can find me on Twitter at Curious Control. And I should have a link to the YouTube channel in there. Or you can just search Past Priority Podcast on YouTube. And it's the one with a really nice looking logo. Um, we're going to be posting episodes um, every Friday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, they're about an hour long. It's uh, run by myself and a couple of really close friends. And we just love to talk about competitive commander. It doesn't always have to be control. We're actually working on an Animar deck tech, which will definitely be out by the time this episode comes out because um, I'm unorganized. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's it. You can find me on a lot of discords, too. Um, Basically anywhere, if you just type at curious control, you'll probably find me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm Great. terminally online. So even if it says I'm offline, I'm there. I'll read your message. I won't respond to it for like eight hours, but I'm there. <laughs> so. Greg, it's always a pleasure. You're one of my favorite people in this community. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Go check out Greg's podcast, the past priority podcast. And uh uh, yeah, thank thank you so much for taking time out of your uh, out of your schedule and sitting here and talking about what cards are good and what people should think about. So appreciate you. Well, that about wraps things up for us here today on this week's episode of the Mind Sculptors. Thank you for tuning in. If you liked this episode or any of our other episodes, please make sure to rate the show on whatever podcast platform you are listening on. Or if you are watching or listening on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and tell us down in the comments what your favorite part of the show was or just your general thoughts. I would also like to thank our top tier patrons, Justin, Adam Hamden, David Sneevely, Dionichis, Jason Bialik, Josh Stein, Matt Boehner, and Senior Coupon. If you too would like to support the show, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Mind Sculptors or check out the link in the description. Thank you again for joining us and from all of us here at the Mind Sculptors, I'm Callahan, and we'll see you next time.